As I said this morning, I want to uh, share what our theme will be for the next couple of weeks and purposely chose this with regard to our uh, upcoming congregational meeting where we just kind of get together and think about the year. Obviously, 2018 has already started, but we're pretty new into it. And so that meeting is also used to just help us think about what God's calling us to do, what we'd like to be able to do, uh, what we see God uh, leading us to do in different ways at different times. And uh, our ministry council, the leadership team of the church here, uh, is seeking God's will in all of that. And that's why uh, I had you and asked you to be praying about that prior to today and continue to pray that God would lead and direct Grace Church. So this morning, in order to get us thinking that way, I want to talk about faith. Now, if you were here last week, Jim Price was talking about faith also. He was talking about this faith of a centurion and how Jesus said to him he hasn't seen faith like that in all of Israel. And he was talking to a Gentile, which was pretty impressive and probably made, made everybody else in Israel angry that he would say such a thing. And so faith, I've obviously, we know as Christians, faith plays a big part in our lives as believers. It's by faith that we come to God. And we'll look at some of that scripture in Hebrews chapter 11. You're probably familiar with it. You'll hear over and over again, by faith, Abraham did X. By faith, Moses did this. By faith, Gideon did this. And we'll look at that. But this morning, I want to kind of focus in on uh, uh interchange that Jesus had with a uh, father who had a demon-possessed boy and uh, was talking about the disciples' inability uh, to heal that boy. To get us thinking that way, though, I want to ask you a question or get you to think back to when maybe you were young or maybe you had young kids or maybe you're in the midst of doing this now uh, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, we're going to be talking about what is the kind of faith that Jesus says moves mountains? But to think about that, I want you to remember when either you were learning how to ride a bike or you were teaching somebody how to ride a bike. And maybe this wasn't your experience. Maybe it was. Hopefully it, it connects because I want to use this to kind of connect with where I think the disciples were because the story I'm going to tell you is really about them and their struggle. And so if you've ever taught somebody how to ride a bike or if you have ridden a bike, you know you don't just get on and automatically you can do it. Did anybody get on the bike the very first time and just have an amazing ride? Okay. So we all can connect in this way. So I was looking for a picture. and Actually, I had a video, and I can't find it. I had a video of me teaching Lily how to ride a bike, and then uh, I'm, and I'll show you how I was doing that, and you probably did the same way, and then I let go, and I had the video of her doing it all by herself. I couldn't find that video. I don't know where it is, uh, but this is a picture to help you think. When I was teaching Lily how to ride a bike, because she can ride a bike now, what I would do is I would hold on to the seat, because she was terrified about falling over, and I would hold on to the seat, and then I, out here in the parking lot where a lot of people learn how to ride bike out here uh, in this parking lot, I was holding on to the seat, and then I was running around the parking lot with her. So she would be pedaling, and I would be holding the seat and running around the, the parking lot with her. And so I wouldn't tell her when I would let go, so she wouldn't start thinking, oh, no, he let go, I'm going to crash. But there were times where I would start letting go. When she first started being able to do it by herself, I didn't, I didn't tell her, and I let go, and then she started doing it. And then we'd start up again, I'd be holding it. And so she started thinking, hey, this is coming pretty easy. I can do this pretty, pretty easy. And then when she started thinking that, stopped focusing on what she was doing and kind of didn't think about dad holding that seat anymore she started wobbling and stuff like that and she started thinking you know she just started learning how to ride a bike so you're not going to be perfect at it right away but she started thinking hey I can get this I don't need dad to be holding the seat anymore I can do this myself and this is the kind of stuff that happens then how many of you was that your experience I don't need you I can just ride the bike and then you just crash 
And what she was failing to realize is the reason when she first started riding the bike, the reason why she was able to do it was because I was holding on to it. Because, I mean, when, when she first started, when I let go, it would be like, and she'd be leaning from side to side, and she fell a couple of times, and fortunately she wasn't petrified and wouldn't get back on the bike, but she did fall. There's a reason why you wear helmets, because it cracked the little plastic. It didn't crack the helmet, but on her helmet there was like a little plastic Elsa thingy from Frozen, and it just cracked that, and the whole thing came off. So it was just this white piece of styrofoam. So that she didn't want to wear that. That wasn't cool enough. But she would get overconfident and not realize that it's really dad who is keeping you up. And so she would think she could do it herself and then realize she couldn't. But eventually she did. Eventually she could do it herself. I didn't have to run along with her. And she was riding by herself. But as soon as she kind of took focus off of what she had just learned and keeping the handlebars straight and kind of leaning a little bit when she turned, as soon as she would lose focus, she would start wobbling and get close to falling. And a couple times she had to put her feet down and, and keep herself from falling, which she learned how to do. But she would lose focus on what she had been taught and what she had learned because she was getting too overconfident. So maybe that was your experience. Maybe you had a child that was like that, that just didn't seem to listen to you in the training of a bicycle. Maybe it's been in a different experience. If you've ever gone someplace and you're like, oh, I don't need directions anymore, and then you're like lost for two hours and you're, I should have just brought the directions along. Or you've done something at home that you have to read the directions to make sure you do it right, and then sometime you're, I don't need those anymore, and you can't remember how to do this. It's something so dumb but I always forget how to set my coffee maker to do auto. I'm like, why can't I remember this? So I go and bring the directions out and put it on. And because I know if I would do it without that, I'd be making coffee at like 3 a.m. or it wouldn't come on to 6 p.m. or whatever. And then I wouldn't have any in the morning. But there's, there's this overconfidence that we can get in ways. And sometimes it gets us into trouble. And really, this is what I see happening with the disciples in this story with Jesus because they were doing something that had been done they had already done it and now they were struggling to do it and I think this is a symptom of us as believers that we can get into sometimes and us as a church that we can get into sometimes where we forget where the source of our power is being derived from we forget where the source of our faith should be put into in order to move forward as believers. I want to share that story with you. Jesus is with his disciples here in Matthew uh, chapter 17. This story is also um, detailed in Mark's biography of Jesus and Mark's gospel in Luke's biography. The same story is detailed there. Uh, so we have three different accounts that we put all together and we kind of create this scene uh, with Jesus, his disciples, this crowd, and it, the scribes are there. So before this moment, before chapter 17, and I'll read from verse 14 through verse 20, before that happens, Jesus is doing his ministry. He is performing miracles. He is feeding thousands. He is making blind people see. He's, there's a lot happening that crowds have seen, the disciples have seen, the scribes have seen, the religious leaders, uh, when I say scribes, that's who they are, they have seen that. And so now this moment of Jesus in chapter 16 talking about the fact that he is going to have to uh, go to the cross, and it's in chapter 16 where Peter makes his confession that you are the Christ, that you are the Messiah, the one from God. Peter makes that confession, and Jesus talks to them about what's going to happen to him uh, and going to the cross. And then the next episode is the transfiguration where Jesus takes Peter, James, and John and they witness this amazing scene on this mountain where Jesus is talking with Moses and Elijah and God, this voice from heaven, says, uh, this is my son. Uh, and uh, Peter, James, and John are there and that's this amazing moment that just happens. Right after that, it says in verse 14, 
when they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. So they had just been a part of this scene, Peter, James, and John. The other disciples were not with them. They were apparently with this crowd, as we'll read. And Jesus and those three disciples come down from that experience to this episode, to this scene. When they came to the crowd, they being Jesus, Peter, James, and John, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. And then Jesus says, You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied, How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, Because you have so little faith. Truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. We were singing that. Nothing will be impossible for you for those who believe. Mark's gospel says the same story. He adds a little bit more detail than what we have here from Matthew. And he talks about this father where this interchange happens. What Matthew didn't record is that scene. Matthew is kind of sticking with the disciples and showing and showcasing the fact that they were not able to do what they had been commissioned to do. There was a father who came to Jesus. That's the one who knelt down before Jesus. He came to Jesus, and he told him this story about his son who was possessed by a demon, had these seizures, had all these problems, and asked Jesus to heal uh, his son. In all those instances, Jesus makes a comment about the belief of this generation. We see a lot of unbelief happening in this story. Jesus is trying to help people overcome their unbelief. So in this episode, the disciples, Peter, James, and John, and Jesus were having this mountaintop experience. The other disciples are with this crowd. Jesus said, you need what I'm going to commission you to do is go out and heal the sick, heal the blind, heal the lame, cast out demons. Jesus commissioned them to do that, and the disciples were doing it. That's why this story is here. It's shocking. Something happened that did not enable the disciples to heal this, this, this boy. They had just been doing it. If you read a few chapters before in Matthew, you'll read some stories about the disciples casting out demons. They had just got done doing that, and now all of a sudden, they can't do it. And so Jesus, Peter, James, and John come down off the mountain, and they see this. And so what we're seeing is unbelief in this setting. And Jesus is making reference to that in what he says there. It's an episode that is reminiscent of something else that happened. And if you were a Jew reading this, you would be able to bring this up. It's shared history that if you make certain comments about things, uh, everybody knows what they're talking about. If I would make veiled comments about 9-11, all of you would know what I'm talking about, and I could share a story about that day or that incident that you would be able to have the context around that because we have that shared history. So this is happening here. This, the story of this mountaintop experience is reminiscent of the time God met with Moses and gave the law. This amazing thing happens. Well, God is speaking directly to Moses. He is giving them the law. This is from God. Moses on that mountaintop, because of being that close to God, is there's just he's shining brightly. He had to veil himself when he came down to the people because they couldn't look at him completely because he had just been with God. This amazing thing happens. God is speaking to us, our Creator, and he's giving us this law. This same God that had just taken us from Egypt and brought us out, and we just walked through some ocean, and it's spread apart. So this just happens with Moses. He's on that mountaintop. Jesus, Peter, and James are on this mountaintop. What does Moses come down to? Do you remember that story? When Moses comes down off of that mountaintop, what, do he, what does he come down to? The Israelites 
had been collecting all of their gold, melting it down, and creating this golden calf and started worshiping it. So they just experienced all that, and there is this lack of belief, this God that had just saved you, this God that is speaking to your people, giving you this law, and Moses walks down from that mountaintop and enters the reality of our lives. God does amazing things. God works in a lot of ways, and then when we get down to it, there's always this element of unbelief, this element of faith that should be there that's not there, and Peter, James, and John, and Jesus walk right into that. I'm trying to put myself in Peter, James, and John's shoes. You've just experienced this. You probably think you can do just about anything. The guy that you're hanging out with just got spoken to by God himself. And so you're probably feeling pretty good as you come down off of this mountain. And then you hear about your nine buddies that can't do something that they had just done not that long ago. And you're wondering to yourself, I would be, what, what's going on? How, how is this possible? I just witnessed this, and I'm hearing and seeing this. There is unbelief in this entire crowd. There's unbelief in the scribes, the religious leaders. In Mark's gospel, if you read that, it's in Mark chapter 9. If you want to page over there, you can and just uh, browse what Mark says about that. The scribes are there, and they're probably making fun of these guys that supposedly are following this Jesus guy, and they can do all this healing and stuff, and they're failing. And there's this big kind of commotion happening in this crowd. That's what Jesus and Peter, James, and John are walking into. And then you have to deal with the disciples themselves. What's going on? Why has it changed? If you page a little bit earlier, you can read about the disciples casting out demons, the disciples healing people. What happened? What's going on that they can't do this? And then in Mark's gospel, if you read that, if you read the, the story that Mark shares about this same scenario, you hear and have this interchange with the father. The father of this boy comes, and he is asking Jesus to do this. He says, your disciples couldn't do it. Can you? And in Mark's gospel, Jesus says, what do you mean, can I? What do you mean, can I do this? And then that's where the father says, I believe that you can help my unbelief. So there's all this kind of unbelief happening in the Gospels, in this particular story. And Jesus recognizes this, and he makes two statements about it that you know, to us may sound a little harsh in how it's worded, but basically this is what Jesus is talking about. He is talking about the general lack of faith that he has found in Israel. He makes comments about that throughout the stories that we read in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He made comment about it in his own hometown. He made comment about it in different places that he's gone where he's actually done some healing and done some ministry. There is this general lack of belief of the people in his generation. And the language that the Scripture is using here is actually giving language to, it is painful for Jesus to see it. I think what it's saying is it is breaking his heart to see the lack of belief. All that, de- that Jesus is doing is not sufficient for them. All the healings, all the preaching, all the miracles, there is still this lack of belief, and it pains Jesus to see it. And now it's right in front of his face, and it's in his own followers. His disciples couldn't do it. And so Jesus ex- is experiencing that, and it's Not, and when we use that word perverse, and it says, you unbelieving and perverse generation, here is what Jesus is saying when he uses that word. It is people refusing to recognize the truth about who he is and why he's come. Just before this, in uh, chapter 16 um, of Matthew, The subtitle, the very beginning, says, Demand for a sign. The religious leaders are demanding Jesus to give them a sign. He has been preaching. He stands up in the synagogue and opens to Isaiah. That is all about him. He's been doing miracles, been doing all this stuff, and now they're asking him for a sign. 
It isn't lack of evidence that's the problem. That's not what the issue is here. It's a willful distortion of it. It's a willful, I don't want to look that way at it. And that's what Jesus is referencing here. He is seeing this happen before his very eyes. And it pains him to see it. A lot of times this is the case in our culture. Faith is such a huge part of what we do and believe as Christians. And oftentimes it's not a lack of evidence that people choose not to believe, but they willfully suppress what they know is the truth because they don't want to believe it. And Jesus is experiencing that, and maybe you've experienced that. I know I have with people that I've come in contact with, people that I know, people that I talk to. There's always one more thing that they need evidence for. And once I've showed them that evidence and laid it all before them, there's always one more thing. It's not the evidence that is the issue oftentimes. It's that I have to believe, that I have to have faith in this God who says all these things, in this Jesus who says all these things. So Jesus walks from this moment, from the moment of the transfiguration, this amazing thing, And he walks down the mountain, and he enters the reality that we live in, this lack of faith. And he sees it in his own disciples as well, and I think it breaks his heart, which is why he makes this comment. It's an unwillingness to take God at his word. As believers, one of the challenges that we have is to not look at everything from a human perspective only. This is what Jesus is saying. If you have just the smallest amount of faith, you could say to this mountain to get up and throw yourself into the sea. That was an idiom that was used in the day to describe a very difficult situation and you overcoming it. He isn't literally saying, I'm going to go to Mount McKinley and tell it to fall into the ocean. That's not what he's talking about. He's telling us, that things that seem insurmountable, if you have just a little bit of faith, you can overcome them. So the disciples apparently were struggling with something because they had just healed this, this, uh, these people before and cast out demons before, and now they could not do it. Something was limiting them. Their perspective was changing. They weren't realizing something about God, about faith, about what it was all about. And sometimes I think we struggle with this as Christians as well. Our faith and having faith that moves mountains is having the kind of faith that you can go through life, which has its ups and downs, and overcome them. That's what Jesus is talking about, because the reality is it's going to happen. You might have that moment where you're on this mountaintop experience, but for the most part, we live down here with those other nine disciples, this crowd, this situation where we can't do it. Where is it going to come from? How, why can't we heal this person? Why can't we cast out this demon? Why can't I overcome this God? Why is this happening? When God is challenging our faith, it usually means there's something difficult before us that in my own ability, I could not do it, but I'm going to put faith in God that he's going to help me overcome it. That's what faith, that's the kind of faith that Jesus is talking about. That's the kind of faith we are called to have. And why should we have that kind of faith? The kind of faith that Jesus says can move mountains. The kind of faith that says there's this huge obstacle in front of me. And you can think about that. What is this huge obstacle in front of you right now? And Jesus says, if you have the faith, you can overcome that. And why can he say that? Because he shows us nothing is impossible with God. This father says, if you can, Jesus says, what do you mean if I can? And he says, you can. Help me in my unbelief. Help me believe that you can do it. Nothing, Jesus says, is impossible for God. Nothing is. And so Jesus displays God's unlimited power. For whatever reason, the disciples couldn't cast this demon out. I think what we're going to see, I think what Jesus is exposing, is the disciples were getting a little bit too much like 
Lily was on that bike. Overconfident, not understanding, hey, dad is the one holding this seat so you don't fall over. Hey, Jesus is the one that is giving you this power. It is not you. It seems that the disciples were beginning to treat what they had the ability to do as their own power and magic trick. They're like, why can't we just did it? Why isn't this working? And Jesus makes the comment to them, this kind only comes out with prayer. Some translations will say prayer and fasting. Two things, two spiritual disciplines that help us get connected with God, that help us stay aligned with God. And apparently the disciples weren't doing that. See, Jesus can say to us, you can tell this mountain to move from this point and throw itself into the sea. You can see that huge obstacle in your way and overcome it. When you derive your power, your strength, from Jesus. When you lose that connection, that's when we start losing our ability to see beyond that obstacle. That is what Jesus is telling the church. That is what he was telling his disciples. God's unlimited power is revealed. Jesus tells this demon to leave and never come back. In Mark's gospel, we read about how long this boy had this possession, and it's not, it didn't just happen. It seemed to be worse than all the others that we read about at times in the gospels. And in a word, in a moment, in an instant, Jesus speaks and casts out the demon. The boy is healed. How do you think that helped their faith in Jesus? Right after that scene, in Mark In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, right after this moment, Jesus tells them again that he's got to go to the cross. Jesus is helping them get faith, the kind of faith that says the Messiah, the promised one, is going to the cross. How can that be? But I am going to take God at his word and believe that Jesus will do what he says he will do and rise again. That's what Jesus was telling the disciples. You have to have that kind of faith. That's what Jesus is telling us. We have to have that kind of faith. And if you have that kind of faith, you can see some pretty amazing things happen. But it all derives from him. Our faith is directly connected to our prayer life. That's why I think Jesus makes that comment in Mark's Gospel that this only comes out with prayer. Nothing, Jesus says, will be impossible for you when you stay connected to me. So if you're struggling in your faith, if you're struggling in your walk currently, if you're struggling seeing how can I possibly overcome this obstacle, what I challenge you to do is pray more. Spend more time with God. Align yourself with what God can do. Now, that doesn't mean all of our problems go away. We certainly didn't see that in the disciples' lives. But it means we can face them with the kind of faith that it takes to move mountains, to overcome obstacles. That's what Jesus is saying. That's the kind of faith we as a church are called to have together. That faith doesn't have to be giant. Jesus says that. If you have faith as small, as little as a mustard seed, this tiny little thing, that's the kind of faith. It's not about the size of your faith. It's about the quality of it. If you have that kind of faith, then you have a deep personal trust and you have an expectation that God is going to move. You have an expectation that God is going to work in your life, in this current situation, in that person's life that you've been praying for. There's no bigger mountain than my friend that I have, personally speaking. There's no bigger mountain than seeing that person come to Jesus. That's as huge of a thing as Mount McKinley falling into the ocean because I told it to. Jesus says if you have this kind of faith, an expectation that God is going to work, nothing is impossible. 
with his kingdom. All of it derives from the one in whom we placed our faith. We as a church, we as a congregation, we have ideas, we have plans, there's things that we want to do. And what I believe God is challenging us as believers is to have this kind of faith to see the obstacles in front of us, to see the challenges before us. I've shared about all of those since I've been here. We have a challenge in reaching our culture. There's a lot of people that say there's not enough evidence. There's a lot of people that have no faith. And these are the very people God has called us to reach. There's lots of things, and we're, we're a small church. We're not that big. All it takes is a little bit a little mustard seed, a little bit of faith. God doesn't need a church of 10,000 to do some amazing things. He needs a few people to have the faith as small as a mustard seed with the expectation that God is going to move and believe that he can do it. And if we do that, nothing will be impossible for God. Paul ends a prayer in Ephesians this way, and I I shared about this with our congregational meeting, and it will be a verse we'll keep coming back to. He ends a prayer for the church in Ephesus, and he says this at the end of his prayer, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that has worked within us. That is what we as a church are. God can do more than you think, than I think, or can possibly imagine. And he can do it because we are deriving our power, getting our strength from Jesus. I, my desire is to be a church known for that. I don't want to be a church who's known for that short, weird pastor that always wears sandals. I don't want to be a church known for that nice facility. I, I want to be a church that's known for God does stuff there. They're not that big, but we've seen God move in some pretty miraculous ways. And all that takes is us together to have this kind of faith. If there's a challenge in your life, God, I think Jesus is saying, do you believe? And the the reality is Jesus can go through all this unbelief, Even the Father himself, who is struggling with it, his own self-doubt, and Jesus heals him anyway. Even in our struggle, even in our lack of faith, Jesus is still able to work. And sometimes we got to be like that dad and say, God, I want to believe. Help my unbelief. I know you can do immeasurably more than I think or imagine. Help me believe. Give me the faith to be able to move this mountain, to see this obstacle and overcome it. If you're struggling with that, I challenge you to increase your prayer life. We as a church do that all the time. There's a group of guys that meets in my office on a Wednesday morning. And we meet there for one purpose, and that's to pray. Every Wednesday morning, we're there praying for you, for this church, for God to move. If you want to have faith like this, I challenge you to start praying more. And I think we as a church need to recognize that God can do more than we think or imagine. Because it's Christ at work in us. And then he gets the glory for that. It's not, oh, look at Grace Church. It's look at what God has done, what God can do. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the faith of people in our own lives that uh, we can look to and say they've had this giant-sized faith, but it wasn't really giant-sized faith. It was the quality of their faith that made them effectual in prayer and in their own lives. Lord, I pray that as Jesus works through the unbelief of this Father, the difficulty of the disciples thinking they could do it themselves, Lord, help us never to lose that tie with you as a church that we know our strength our ability comes from you Lord help us to never lose that tie as a people that our prayer life is directly connected to our faith 
Lord, help us to be a people that believes and expects you to move. Lord, I pray that you would do amazing things, more than we think or imagine, and that we could glorify you because of that. Lord, I pray that people who are connected to Grace Church, people in our community, people wherever would hear about the things that you can do, Lord, that would strengthen their faith, Lord, and that might bring them to faith as well. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.